<clears throat> I started writing actually uh, very young. I started writing when this thing happened to my eyes. I, when I was about uh, 16 at school, I had this violent attack of keratitis, which uh, I had to leave school because I became pr practically blind and I had to learn Braille and to continue my education with tutors. And during that time, I, I learned to use a typewriter. It was the only way I could write. And then I started um, to write. I actually wrote a whole novel at that period, which um, I never subsequently read. And uh, this has disappeared. I rather regret that it has disappeared, because I would be interested to know what it was like now. It was a sort of romantic... Uh, it wasn't very romantic. It was a rather bitter novel about a young man's relationship with the two different types of women, as I remember it. I discovered that I liked writing, that I had a certain gift for it. And I had, of course, before I went blind, uh, intended to become a doctor. I presume if I had gone on with that, I would have gone into medical research because I don't think I would have been a very good practicing doctor, but I might have been a fairly good uh, medical researcher. But why wouldn't you have been any good at medical practice? But, um, I would have been good enough in sort of personal relationships, which I think are tremendously important with, uh, in a good, uh, good doctor. I mean, uh, I was diffident and shy and awkward then. I think I've slightly improved with age. But... Um, uh, I don't know that I would have been very good. But um, I think I would always have been very interested in the research part of the thing. But anyhow, <clears throat> I couldn't go on with that kind of scientific career because I couldn't use a microscope or do any of the necessary work in the laboratory. Uh, so that this determined uh, the, my choice of a career, that I had to go into something else, and then I discovered that I could write and that I did like writing. And from that time on, I, I always wrote a good deal. I wrote when I was an undergraduate. I wrote a lot of verse in those days. And then I also wrote a certain amount of prose. And um, I did publish my first prose book when I, when was it? I think about 1920, I think, the first uh, book of stories that I wrote. How did you come to publish? Did you already know publishers, or did you write to them? Well, I'd published a certain amount of, uh, of verse in periodicals. I'd published two uh, little volumes of verse with uh, Blackwell at Oxford, and uh, a certain amount had been published, as I say, in papers like The Nation and, uh, and in uh, art, art journals of different kinds. Um, and I'd written a certain number of essays and stories which had been published. And I sent um, my first uh, book of stories to Chateau and Windus, where Frank Swinnerton read them and uh, set his seal of approval upon them. And I've been with Chateau's ever since. I've always enjoyed it. I've always... Uh, it's it's n it never come very easily. I mean, all my thoughts, in a sense, are second thoughts. I, I tend to write everything over again. But uh, but I like it. It's laborious, but it's it's work which um, which I find very rewarding and extraordinarily interesting. I mean, this uh, seeking the the right way of saying of something. And I must say, <clears throat> I was very interested not long ago in looking over an old volume of, um, of essays which I'd written while at Oxford for my tutor. Uh, on, I, I took the English literature at Oxford, and these were essays on all sorts of literary subjects, I mean, from Chaucer down to the present day. And I was interested and surprised to find that uh, I was writing quite well at that time. I mean, that I had uh, a certain feeling for style, and that there was a, even a certain elegance in uh, what I was doing, even at the age of, of 20, that I, I had, obviously, some kind of natural gift for writing, uh, and uh, although, as I say, it's always been uh, a considerable work for me, I mean, it's, it's this, uh, I, I never get the results I want, except as a result of, uh, of careful correction and going over and rewriting. 
I don't work out anything in great detail. I mean, I, I sort of start a thing and then it becomes clear that this has to be done and I reach a point out in front and therefore this means something at the back has to be changed. And it develops in this way. I don't work out a thing in any elaboration in advance. In your early years, was your defect of eyesight a great handicap? Well, every handicap, of course, is a, is a challenge. I mean, one is limited, naturally, by in what one can do. I was strictly limited in all kinds of otherwise normal activities. I mean, many things that I like doing, like mountain climbing and so on, became very difficult or impossible for me. I couldn't practice any kind of sport requiring hitting a ball, because I couldn't see the balls. And uh, <clears throat> on the other hand... The fact that there is this kind of challenge, if the handicap isn't too great, uh, the, the challenge can often stimulate one to do things which I think in, in other circumstances one wouldn't do. I mean, it's in a, in a sense a little bit like the, the problem of the sculptor, the, pro, the sculptor wrestling with extremely hard and intransigent stone is forced to do things which the sculptor who works only in clay doesn't have to do. I mean, it's in a sense too easy. So that unless the handicap is too great and is overwhelming, it, it does act as a kind of stimulus and, and drives one on to do things. Um, I did read a great deal, and I'm extremely astonished at how much I was able to read, because at the beginning, <clears throat> for about two years after the, this thing came upon me when I was 16, I couldn't read at all. As I say, I had to learn Braille, and I had to have tutors who read to me. And uh, then, little by little, I was able to read. With a, But I did all my reading while I was at Oxford with a, a powerful magnifying glass, which uh, I must say I'm amazed that I got through as much as I did. And it must was obviously always rather tiring, this uh, whole process. But uh, I managed to do it, and... Uh, I suppose I've always had a, a passion for knowledge and a certain gift for coordinating facts. I mean, this is what interests me in writing, in, in expression, in thought, is the, the attempt to coordinate different fields, the attempt to say many things at the same time, the attempt to bring together into a single coherent and meaningful whole a great many apparently disparate uh, events and, uh, and data. Um, this has uh, been the ideal of writing that I've always had, and I um, think I have a certain gift for it. But, and this is what interests me. And, and sometimes I, I go too far, I get carried away and try to put in too much, and I require then to go back and uh, simplify and cut things out. But uh, I've always, I mean, I, I really don't like the very bare, bald, classical style because it's, much, to my mind, hopelessly oversimplified and therefore not true. I mean, life in its uh, reality is incredibly complex and very, very subtle. And therefore, I would think that any form of art which is, is as simplified, say, as the French tragedy of the 17th century, is intrinsically an inferior art. I mean, maybe very, very elegant and beautiful. But if you can do, it, impose order upon a much more complex uh, mass of material as Shakespeare was able to do, this seems to me intrinsically a superior form of art. And I would say this is true of any kind of art. I mean, isn't this the distinction in the uh, pictorial arts between what is technically known as fine art and... Uh, and the crafts, the crafts are extremely simple forms. I mean, the form of pottery is exceedingly simple, and it can be incredibly beautiful. But at the same time, is it as high a form of art as a great composition where enormous numbers of elements, both formal and uh, literary in the widest sense and emotional, uh, are brought together and harmonized in a great composition? Uh, I would feel unquestionably that the the great uh, composition which brings together and harmonizes many elements is 
intrinsically a higher form of art than the, the simple, elegant, so-called classical form. After all, life is immensely complex. Why pretend that it isn't? I mean, uh, and why not attempt with a sufficient background of, of knowledge and information to make some kind of synthesis, some kind of meaningful pattern of, of a large extent of information? Uh, I find this kind of, uh, of new criticism unspeakably boring. I mean, it seems to me so barren, and, and it's this hideous jargon they've invented. I don't know what it's all about. It just bores me absolutely stiff, this whole thing. Uh, it seems to me so trivial in many respects. Or, although I, I think probably some of this work has to be done, this kind of very elaborate and meticulous uh, linguistic work is probably useful but to regard it as a, as the sort of be all and end all of criticism seems to me absolutely absurd. Are there, in your opinion, any writers who will survive and will be read? Actually, I think the, the most exciting people that I read as a as an undergraduate and just afterwards were French writers. I, I got sort of my introduction to French literature at that time. I mean, I read Proust when he first could have came out in 1914, uh, and Ducote de Chesson. Then I read the French poets then. The, uh, Mallarmé made an immense impression upon me, and still does. I, I'm still very fond of him. And uh, Rambo made an immense impression on me then. No one author has had very great influence over me. I mean, I, I get things out of all reasonably good authors, and even out of some bad authors that I read. I used to get a lot out of Proust. I reread him some of it in the other day and was rather disappointed. I don't know why. I mean, it didn't seem to me that the... I mean, I read the last volume, The, the Temps Retrouvé. It seemed to me curiously remote and uh, unbelievable and unreal. And even the first volume, which I read part of the other day, passages which I thought were very beautiful in the early days, I didn't get very much out of. I don't know why. It's very strange, because it, it moved me immensely when it first appeared. I must, I must read it again and have another look at it. Well, I think some of Hemingway's stories are very remarkable, the short stories. And... Um, I haven't read the more recent books, which I understand are not particularly good. Uh, nor have I read the more recent Faulkner's. But I liked some of the early books, Soldier's Pay and Light in August and Sanctuary. But I, I confess I haven't read anything recently. Joyce, it seemed to me, seemed to think that words were omnipotent. I mean, they are not omnipotent. He was a very strange man. I used to see him sometimes in Paris. This extraordinary, what may be called his, his magic view of, of words. I mean, it, it sort of, you'll never forget sitting next to him once at dinner and mentioning to him, which I thought would have given him pleasure, and it did, that I'd just been rereading the Odyssey. And he, uh, his immediate response was, he said, now do you realize what the derivation of Odysseus, the name Odysseus is? I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, it really comes from the two words, Udais, meaning nobody, and Zeus, meaning God. And that uh, Odysseus is a really a symbol of creation of man out of nothing. Well, I mean, this is exactly the sort of, uh, of etymology which would have been made by Albertus Magnus in the 13th century. I mean, which had absolutely no relation, of course, to anything which uh, we would regard as, uh, as realistic etymology. But it, this completely satisfied Joyce's mind. And this, uh, this curious sort of magic approach to words as having some sort of intrinsic value apart from their references was a very characteristic thing in him. Ulysses is obviously a very extraordinary book. I mean, I don't exactly know why he wrote it, because I mean, a great deal of Ulysses seems to me to be taken up with showing 
A large number of methods in which novels cannot be written. I suppose it's a great book. It, to, to me, it, it remains a little bit too static. The whole character of Bloom. I mean, it, it, well, there are. I mean, there are splendid passages. I don't think it's a success as a whole. What is the relationship of the artists to his time? The advances in literature depend on these purely fortuitous arrival of extraordinary people. I mean, nobody could conceivably have foreseen Shakespeare. I mean, nothing preceding Shakespeare really indicated what this man would be. Nothing in Russian literature really indicated that Tolstoy would come along. I don't know. I mean, after the event, one was by stretching the imagination a little and stretching the facts, one <coughs> may be find... Uh, uh, John the Baptists and precursors of various kinds, but <clears throat> are they really precursors? Do they really say anything? I don't know. I mean, I have this curious feeling that uh, uh, that uh, this extraordinary roulette wheel of heredity uh, plays such a part in, in literature. I mean, we just sometimes you get twenty-seven ro reds in a row at. Uh, at Monte Carlo, and this may happen at certain periods of history. You get an extraordinary series of people turning up who happen to have a fairly good environment and can can do something with it. But uh, is there really any kind of uh, of what you call a a pruning period? I mean, I think what you can always say in the history of any given art that the I mean, so often you see that the the development of, a, of an art form is due not to external circumstances at all, but is due to the internal logic of the arts. I mean, the whole process of development towards the Baroque is away from symmetry towards asymmetry, and it's exactly in the opposite direction uh, as it is in music, as you find in music. The, uh, instead of going from asymmetry to symmetry, you go from symmetry to asymmetry. And in either case, it is the logic the internal logic of the particular art which dictates the development of the form and not any external circumstances. I mean, if you look at the external circumstances in which these people live, look at a man like Schütz, for example. I mean, Schütz proceeds from sort of polyphonic through a kind of monodic to uh, the beginnings of the sonata form. And, but, I mean, his life consisted in continually running away from the Thirty Years' War. He was in the middle of the most appalling circumstances but you find absolutely no trace in the music at all. You, I mean, there's nothing catastrophic or, or violently emotional in the music. There is just this steady uh, development uh, according to the internal logic of the art. And here again, I mean, uh, one is left wondering what on earth exactly is the relation between art and life. I don't know. I mean, it's it's much much less clear than uh, some critics maintain that it is. I mean, there's other factors. I mean, this, this internal logic of the art is of immense importance in the whole history of artistic development and may have very little to do with the external events. And similarly, the, the pe peculiar temperament and physique of the artist also has an enormous uh, part to play and has, again, very little to do with the external events of the around him. A good many novels seem to me to have singularly li little reference to it. I mean, uh, you go uh, find a lot of novels which are solely dealing with uh, personal relationships in a rather narrow world. Uh, but, and again, you certainly find uh, a great deal of evidence of the art forms developing uh, not in relationship to the external world, but in relationship to these, the, their own internal logic. Again, you have their geniuses and geniuses. I mean, there are some who are content to work within the tradition in which they find themselves, and others who find it necessary to modify that tradition. I mean, after all, take the case of Chaucer. I mean, here you had a man who, out of the blue, really developed psychology, I mean, his contemporaries and his predecessors had been interested in psychology, finally, only from an ethical and religious point of view. They were 
not interested in the variations of human character as such, they were interested in the variations of human character as determining whether you went to hell or heaven. Uh, and, I mean, take the, his greatest uh, predecessor in narration, Boccaccio. I mean, it's quite incredible, the summariness and the lack of detail of the psychological descriptions, or even the physical descriptions in Boccaccio, they just don't exist. I mean, he just said there was an extremely handsome young man in Florence who fell in love with an exquisitely beautiful girl, and this is about as far as it ever goes in Boccaccio. Then you find the later Canterbury Tales with these extraordinarily fully developed uh, physical and psychological uh, characteristics, uh, which... Uh, found no imitations afterwards. I mean, this extraordinary man turned up and uh, everybody admired him a great deal, but uh, nobody was able to follow him. These are extraordinary facts, I, I, I must say, I find. And yet he's a man of his own time, but he's a man also completely outside his own time, as far as I can see. Speaking as yourself, speaking also as a member of your generation, how serious... How enduring was the impact on your mind of Freud? I was never as intoxicated by Freud as some people were. I mean, I think, uh, and uh, I get less intoxicated as I go on. I mean, I think he he omitted so much from his purview of human beings. I mean, this fact that he really leaves out completely out of account the whole physical side of man. I mean, to listen to Freud, you would think that man had only two points in his anatomy, the two ends of the digestive tube, I mean, the mouth and the anus. I mean, nothing else exists in the Freudian anatomy at all. And yet there is a good deal in between, and we know very well that uh, there are many things on the ne neurological and biochemical level which profoundly affect our minds. But Freud, and <clears throat> although he did himself say that uh, he finally all... Uh, nervous disorders would turn out to be organic, but he did say that he, in the meanwhile, until we found out more about them, we could treat them successfully and by purely psychological means. I think this is absolutely untrue. Uh, and his followers, of course, dogmatically insist upon this. I mean, in the most ridiculous way, the, the orthodox Freudians, well, thank heaven, the most uh, psychotherapists are not orthodox Freudians now. They are um, eclectics and making use of organic and chemical methods uh, uh, and psychological and sociological methods which guarantee a cure which uh, the pure Freudian just doesn't get with his eight years on the couch. More and more as I learn more about uh, what is happening now in the field of uh, neurology and um, biochemistry and in the general study of human physique and the classification of of human types, uh, I feel more and more strongly that uh, you have to have the total organic approach. I mean, th this is trying to see the thing uh, as a totality. I mean, it, it's just we have to make the best not only of both worlds, but of all the worlds. We, man is a multiple amphibian who lives in about 20 different worlds at once. And if anything is to be done with him to improve his uh, enjoyment of life, to improve the way he can realize his desirable potentialities, to improve his health, to improve the quality of his relations with other people, to improve his morality. We have to attack on all the fronts at once. And we have the greatest, uh, what may be called the original sin of the human mind, is sloth, it's oversimplification. We want to think that there is only one cause for any given phenomenon, Therefore, there is one cure. There is not, and this is the trouble, that uh, no uh, uh, phenomenon on the human level, which is a level of immense complexity, can ever have a single cause. I mean, we must always take at least half a dozen uh, conspiring uh, causal factors into consideration. And any attempt to improve human life has to take into account the psychological factors, the sociological factors, the physical factors, the chemical factors, all of them. Uh, and uh, practically, you see, I mean, the trouble with the Freudians is that they took only one set of factors into account. Well, of course, their system doesn't work at all well. 
uh, in practice. So the term, uh, this as I say, is the sort of <coughs> intellectual and scientific correlate of my feeling that the highest forms of art are those which impose a kind of harmony and order upon the greatest possible number of factors. Don't you think that by the 19th century, by Victorian times, although there was all this injustice and horror, there was a beginning of social consciousness. There's a considerable drive towards amelioration of social conditions. And a lot of reforms took place. I remember years ago going to look at the mummy of, of Jeremy Bentham at the top of the big staircase in University College in Gower Street, going with the Schweitzer to see it. And one opens the door, and there sits this sweet little old gentleman with he has a wax face and his silvery hair which falls over his shoulder and a bottle green swallowtail coat with brass buttons and striped cotton trousers and, and uh, varnished pumps smiling at one. And um, Schweitzer looked at him for some time and said, Oh, I'm always so very, very fond of Jeremy Benson. Benson. <clears throat> He's one of the few philosophers whose doctrines never did any harm, but on the whole did nothing but good. I thought this was a very interesting thing. And he said, oh, compare him with Hegel, for example, and sort of shook his head in despair. And it is quite true that uh, the, if the tree is known by its fruits, well then the Benthamism is infinitely to be preferred to Hegelianism, which gave us Marxism and Prussianism and all kinds of horrors. Whereas Bentham gave us uh, Chadwick and decent sewage systems and proper municipal government and things like that, all of which are wholly to the good. Won't you say something about D.H. Lawrence? I met Lawrence during the war, and of course I knew him best uh, later on in the last four years of his life, in 26 to 30. He was perfectly extraordinary as a human being. He was uh, extremely fascinating, and he was always stimulating, a little alarming to be with. I mean, because he, uh, he was very fond of my first wife and we got on very well. And I think we were among the relatively few people with whom he didn't one time or another have a quarrel. Uh, and uh, we saw, as I say, a great deal of him in the last four years of his life. Why was he always quarreling? Well, he was a, a prickly man and... <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I mean, he, he somehow did it on principle, I feel. No, I don't know if that's wrong. I don't know what he... It was a very strange thing. He would sort of burst out in this uh, uh, curious way against people. But uh, it was always a pleasure to be with him and to, to hear his comments on things, his reactions to nature and so on were always very, very, very fascinating. I mean, he was, he was very charming, generally. I mean, uh, he would sometimes sort of get cross, but he, he could be very amusing and uh, entertaining. And he was happy. I mean, he was happy sort of sitting on a stone. and lo I mean, very like, uh, remember that poem of Wordsworth's um, expostulation and reply, sitting on an old grey stone as he... Said. And, of course, a lot of his life was spent in this way, and then he would get an urge to write, and then write for 18 hours a day. I mean, it was, uh, it was very extraordinary to see him at work. It was a sort of possession. He would rush on at this, his hand moving at a tremendous rate, and never correct anything, because if he was dissatisfied, he would start again from the beginning. His capacity for perception is, is uh, I mean, it was a great pleasure and, instruction, really, to go for a walk with Lawrence. I mean, the, the sort of way he perceived the world was so intense and, uh, and exciting. The point is that you, you, can't, you must have both. I mean, the blood and the flesh are there, and in certain respects they are wiser than the intellect. I mean, the, if we interfere with the blood and the flesh with our conscious mind, we get psychosomatic troubles. But on the other hand, we have to do a lot of things with the conscious mind. Why can't we do both? I mean, we have to do both. This is the whole art of life, of making the best of all the worlds. 
And here again is one of these fatal examples of uh, of uh, trying to make everything conform to the standards of only one world, which is perfectly uh, seeing that we are amphibians. It's no good. These were perverse sides of him. There's no doubt about it. But then, and I think he would have sort of gradually have emerged from this curiously one-sided view of life and attempt to make all life conform to one kind of a pattern. I feel now that, you know, obviously the sensual side of man is of immense importance, and but again, this is the uh, the question of making the best of both worlds. This is the the problem: is how do we get it? <coughs> reconcile it with consciousness? How do we become fully aware of it? How do we integrate it into uh, our lives? I mean, uh, this is the important problem. Of course, uh, it's interesting to see what uh, what has been done historically in this uh, field to, to achieve precisely this. I mean, this is the interest, for example, of such things as um, as Tantra in, in India and Tibet. I mean, this is an, an attempt to uh, to find means whereby the spirituality quotes can be uh, expressed and discovered in terms of the, of the ordinary processes of life, including the sensual processes. I mean, th- this to me is the supreme doctrine now. I mean, the whole Mahayana approach of the summing up the, of the doctrine which says that nirvana and samsara are one, the, the world of liberation and the world of appearances, are identical, provided you can find eternity within time. I mean, people like Blake knew all about this and <clears throat> were attempting to do it. And, and this, uh, this, it seems to me, is the essence of the of the art of life, that um, discovering these methods of finding, so to say, the absolute in the relative, the timeless in the temporal, the spiritual within the world of sense and matter. And I don't think it's impossible. I mean, I think that this is the whole art of living, which, um, again, this is part of the of this uh, thing which I feel to be supremely important, of making the best of both worlds, of, of uh, finding out how to, to harmonize these uh, disparate elements uh, in the human being. And of course, if you had marriage as an institution and this other thing breaking in and smashing the institution, well then obviously you got into trouble. When uh, passion was di- completely divorced from marriage and broke up marriage, well, then necessarily it, it seemed a kind of diabolic possession almost. I mean, passion seemed, for the, the Greeks uh, spoke about it, I mean, arte in Homer, uh, meaning the state of mind which leads to disaster in the, in the uh, tra- tragedians, it just means disaster, but in Homer it means the state of mind leading to disaster. And Ate was a daughter of Zeus, whom Zeus, for his own strange and practical joke-like purposes, used to let loose on people. I mean, uh, Ate was the person who blinded Agamemnon into uh, stealing uh, Achilles' girl from him. And he, when he, for they reconcile, he apologizes and says, but it wasn't I who did it, it was Ate who did it. <clears throat> and... Uh, um, Achilles says, yes, of course it was. Arte is really very serious. And, uh, and <clears throat> if you had this idea, I mean, the, the, the sexual passion was just one of the manifestations which uh, the, this mischievous daughter of Zeus who could uh, possess you, uh, one, one of the ones that she imposed uh, upon human beings. They can now blame it, fortunately, on uh, their complexes and uh, well, the mothers having not weaned them properly or something of the kind. I mean, uh, in fact, it is now the conception of the unconscious, isn't it, that we use instead. But the, we don't use, you see, the, what the Freudians don't use is the, is the counterpart in Greek, uh, in Homeric literature, which is menos, which is the 
and the, the divine capacity to do the impossible. You're suddenly filled with this uh, sort of inspiration. With, I mean, even horses get it sometimes. I mean, a horse gets so much menace that he can gallop along at a terrific rate. And you get it uh, in fighting, you get it uh, in talking with people, and it's perfectly true. I mean, these uprushes of greater, more than normal, almost supernatural powers and capacities which uh, are a fact of experienced life. I think these two conceptions are very interesting. And of course, the, until you have a clear conception of the unconscious, both on its negative and its positive side, you must uh, have resort to these ideas yeah. of supernatural possessions. No, I mean, I think there, there's a possibility of sexual relations not involving powerful love, but involving sort of friendliness and playfulness. I mean, I think there are many stages of, mm. of uh, sexual relations which are also quite valuable interpersonal relations, although they may not be at the supremely satisfying quality. But obviously the the relationship merely of a man who goes into a brothel and takes the first prostitute is, is a highly unsatisfactory relation. I mean but it's possible to imagine relationships short of the of the highest a great deal more satisfactory than that. I mean of a of a kind of many kinds of of relationships which do involve some degree of personal involvement. You began by making a reputation as a cynical iconoclast. Would you say something about the process that took you to your interest in unorthodox religion? I was always interested in the descriptions and uh, philosophies of the mystical life. I remember as an undergraduate um, reading Jakob Burma and having various uh, Catholic friends who were inter who knew a certain amount about the mystical tradition in Catholicism. And um, I read a fair amount at that time. Then I'm with sort of mixture of, of admiration and hostility. With derision? Not with derision, but with, uh, with a good deal of skepticism and... Uh, um, with a great deal of fascinated interest, and then when I came to read more and meet numbers of people who knew about Oriental material, <clears throat> read a good deal of that, and uh, came in touch with men who'd um, had a first-hand experience. And this interests me very much. I mean, they, again, this is making the best of both worlds. This uh, utopian fantasy I've just finished is about a society in which, owing to historical accidents, there has been a mingling of Western with Oriental influences, uh, so that uh, both sides are, are developed and an attempt is made to, to get the best out of both sides. Many serious... Uh, Philosophers like Northrop, for example, The Meeting of East and West, it's a frightfully dull book, but it's a, it's a genuine, serious attempt to make some kind of a synthesis. But aren't Eastern ideas and presumptions utterly different from ours? After all, in the past, there have been plenty of syntheses between East and West. I mean, the Christianity was one, after all. Neoplatonism certainly got a good deal from the further East, which became a very important stream in Christianity. I don't think they are utterly different. I mean, did you read a book which I, I think is a very good book by this Englishman who's lived for many years in Japan and taught there, Blythe, called Zen in English Literature? A very good book. And pointing out, uh, I mean, how much there is in English literature, which is profoundly Zen-like. I mean, Wordsworth is full of Zen, and Whitman is full of Zen, and many, many people have this sort of attitude towards nature. I mean, the Japanese artistic representation of it, in both in landscape and in the haiku, is, is perhaps more refined than anything we did, more sort of elegant. But nevertheless, it's of the same order, it seems to me. And I mean, in a curious way, I would say that uh, 
intellectually speaking, the shortest way to India from the West is via Japan and the Far East. Because, I mean, we share with them this kind of nature mysticism which the Indians never developed. And, I mean, the Indians, after all, never developed a landscape art where the Chinese developed it a thousand years before we did. Uh, and it's possibly the most wonderful religious painting in the world, the great Sung landscapes. Um, so that um, I don't think there is anything profoundly alien. I mean, th this does represent a deliberate attempt to cultivate uh, perception and imagination, to cultivate these non-verbal sides of the total human organism uh, to their highest pitch of refinement and awareness. Surely, Zen is just the kind of inward turning which makes for cushioning an otherwise intolerable existence. But Zen isn't really all inward turning. I mean, it's, it's outward turning in some ways. I mean, it's both inward and outward. It's, uh, after all, this, uh, nobody's been more acutely aware of the of landscapes, of flowers, of birds, than the Chinese artists. And uh, this does represent a whole, and uh, Japanese artists too, uh, represent a whole uh, social attitude towards the external world of seeing infinity in a grain of sand. I mean, this, the, the whole the, the Blake poem exactly sums up what they, were, what they were after and what they so consummately succeeded in doing. I mean, this is simultaneously outward and inward, which seems to me the most desirable state you can possibly have. The Japanese landscape art was 200 years later than the Song landscape art, which was the early expression of Zen in, in the Far East, and the expression of Buddhism. They have their religion in Shintoism. They have various Buddhist sects which are full of ritual and symbols and so on. But they do have, and there is a certain element of this in Christianity too, this idea of a, of a non-dogmatic, non-symbolic, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it religion, I'd just call it an approach to the universe. Uh, I mean, they're not worshipping anybody particularly, but they're just... Uh, this is the way they, they want to respond to the universe with the maximum of sensibility, with the greatest perception of the, sort of, of the mystery within the explained and, uh, and uh, understood world. I mean, uh, again, this is making the best of both worlds, to, to understand as much as you can and to label and to classify, but at the same time, behind the labels, to perceive the fathomless mystery of existence, which is the, the whole essence of Zen, it seems to me. And in this respect, I feel that this uh, approach to the fathomless mystery is far better than the, say, the Vedanta or the Hinayana Buddhist approach, which is, consists of this um, contemplation, which is intense concentration, therefore in almost universal exclusion of everything. I mean, the, the point of whole point of the later Mahayana uh, doctrine is that it includes things. I mean, it, it, it permits you to live in the world, but perceiving the Absolute, uh, perceiving Nirvana, not outside the world, as the Arhat does in the Hinayana tradition, but perceiving it within it and realizing it in acts of work and love. I mean, I, I don't know any higher... Um, um, ideal of life than that. I mean, it, it seems to touch on every level, on the ethical, the, uh, the philosophic, the uh, artistic. What part has the supernatural in your life? Uh, I don't exactly know what people mean by the supernatural. I mean, in practice, I would say that what people call the natural in our Western tradition is in fact our projection of concepts upon the world. I would say this is, uh, the natural is our tendency to project uh, our notions and concepts upon the outer world. I mean, to see the outer world not as the immediate datum of experience, but a, as an embodied label, as, a, as the illustration of some generalization already pre-existing in our skulls. This is what we call the natural world. The supernatural world, as far as I'm concerned, 
is in effect the genuinely natural world, which is the world of immediate experience without all these concepts imposed upon it. I mean, th anyone who has uh, ever had the experience of, of seeing the world without uh, labels and concepts immediately has the impression of its being supernatural. And I mean, in a curious paradoxical way, nature as it is in itself, in as much as we can ever know it in itself, is supernatural. The all too natural is this all too human word of, world of concepts which we impose upon nature. And this, as far as I'm concerned, is the difference between the natural and the supernatural. The natural is, is what we, uh, is our picture of the world with, with, with its names and its labels imposed upon it, the utilitarian and scientific and, and generally day-to-day -day picture. And the supernatural is the, the world uh, as it comes to us in its profoundest uh, mystery of, I mean, one is sometimes suddenly aware of this, this bottomless mystery of existence. I mean, suddenly you're hit by this thing. If you choose to call this the supernatural, I and mean, I don't know what other sense it has. I mean, I don't believe in mysterious beings going around and arranging things, but I, I do believe in the in the profound, unfathomable mystery of life, which I think has a sort of divine quality about it. I think there is a mysterious being, but whether he goes around arranging things is another question. I don't, I don't, I just don't know. I mean, uh, I think one can be complete uh, agnostic and a complete mystic at the same time. I don't see any incompatibility with mysticism and the most skeptical scientific approach. I mean, the there's no incompatibility, just as there's no incompatibility between being a biochemist and having a taste for music. I'm entirely on the side of the mystery. I mean, I, I, any attempt to explain away the mystery is ridiculous. This fundamental everyday mystery of our existence is the, something which we mustn't try to avoid through intellectual explanation. We have to have intellectual explanations, but we have to be perfectly clear that they're, they're not completely satisfying, that we must never take these words too seriously. Words are very important, but they, if we take them too seriously, we destroy everything. But uh, if we can somehow learn to make the best of both worlds, the worlds of conceptual explanation, and the worlds of immediate experience, the word of the mystery as it's actually given, then we have a full and complete life. Otherwise, we have a, either the life of the sort of savage without any intellectual side at all, or else the so-called life of reason, which is wholly unsatisfactory. We have to have both. We must make the best of both worlds. And the Greeks did pretty well up to a point, but I mean, the Greeks had their appalling limitations. I mean, the, the whole view of women was utterly uh, unsatisfactory. They had no view of uh, an adequate kind of marriage, no view of a, a, a permanent love relationship between the sexes. I mean, in that way, they were frightfully limited. But they, in other ways, I think they did handle the problem of the irrational very well. I don't know enough about uh, older civilizations to, to, to know which uh, did it well. I mean, I think... Many of them obviously did it pretty well. I mean, I suppose the Chinese did it pretty well. But though uh, I'm quite sure that uh, we could improve upon it, I don't think we do it very well. And we have such bad symbols. I mean, we have really no great symbols now. And these, all that we have are these ridiculous nationalist symbols like flags and swastikas and whatnot. But there are no sort of great cosmic symbols. I mean, when you think of the staggering symbols that the Indians produced. I mean, the, the dancing Shiva, for example, we've never produced anything as comprehensive as this. The dancing Shiva, the, those little bronze statues, it is the, the Shiva with four arms dancing with one foot raised. Uh, and, well, I mean, I go into the details, they're really quite extraordinary. It's uh, the, the figure stands within a great circle, a sort of halo, which has flames going out, I mean, the symbols of flames. And this is the, the circle of mass, energy, space, time. I mean, this is the material world, the great world, of the all-embracing material world with its flames, which are energy. 
Within this, Shiva dances. He's called Nataraja, the lord of the dance. And he dances. He's everywhere in the universe. I mean, this is, this is his dance. The, the manifestation of the world is called his lila, his play. It's, uh, I mean, he sends his rain upon the just and the unjust. And he's not a, he's beyond good and evil, of course. It's all an immense manifestation of play. Uh, his, uh, he has this long hair, which is the hair of the yogi, contemplative, and it streams out to the limits of the universe. You see, therefore, he, this sort of yogic knowledge of this contemplation includes everything. He has four arms. In the upper right arm, he holds a little drum, which is the drum which summons things into creation. You beat upon this drum, and things come into existence. In his left arm, he holds a fire which is what destroys everything. Uh, he both creates and destroys. His uh, lower right hand is held up in this attitude, which means, be not afraid, in spite of everything, it is all right. The other hand points down at his feet, and one foot is planted squarely on the back of a repulsive dwarf, this infinitely powerful dwarf called Muyalaka, I think his name is, who is the, uh, the ego. And he has to break the back of the ego, you see. The, uh, what he's really pointing at is the other foot, which is raised. And this means this foot is raised against gravitation and is the symbol of um, spiritual contemplation. The whole thing is there, you see. I mean, the, the world of space and time and matter and energy the world of um, creation and destruction, uh, the world of psychology, I mean, how do you get out of this? I mean, if you don't break the back of the ego, you're lost. And if you don't uh, uh, practice um, contemplation, uh, there will be no liberation for you. I mean, it, uh, we don't have anything remotely approaching such a comprehensive symbol, which is both cosmic and psychological and spiritual. I mean, it is really a most unfortunate that we have such miserable uh, symbols. It's part of uh, the regular Hinduism, but it is specifically Shivaite. And then one of the manifestations, of course, is called Bhairava of Shiva, where, who is also dancing, but he dances in cemeteries. And I mean, to remind us that um, the dance of life isn't always very jolly. I mean, that he dances just as much in in misery and death as in life and elation. I and mean, this has to be accepted. And of course, again, it's only by the lifted foot that we can accept it. I mean, it actually is in completely compatible with the modern scientific idea. I mean, it includes the world, you see, of mass energy, space and time. Uh, and the idea of the, the infinite energy dancing timelessly and forever through this world. Uh, dancing through human uh, mentality, too. I mean... Uh, that the world is felt to be, of course, a kind of outrage because the play goes on even inside ourselves, although we are sentient beings, and yet the hand is raised, everything is finally all right, in spite of everything, if, as Buddha says, I show you sorrow and the ending of sorrow. The ending of sorrow is putting your foot on the back of the dwarf and raising the, foot, the other foot in... Uh, against gravity into the state of contemplation. I mean, the whole thing is there, stated in this uh, single, extremely elegant. I mean, the, uh, these uh, Shiva images from the south of India are very, very elegant. They're most beautiful pieces of sculpture, the best of them. But uh, it's a shame we don't have any good symbols like this uh, to, uh, to remind us of who we are and of uh, what we can do about it, if anything. No, we're very, very poor in it. I mean, we have some of the Christian symbols, which are not really. I mean, the symbol of the cross is, is fairly good, but it's, it's, uh, it doesn't take into account the sort of cosmic side of life. I mean, it doesn't take into account mass, energy, space, and time, which is essential. It doesn't take into account, I mean, as it stands, it doesn't take into account the uh, importance of uh, contemplation. No, it's, uh, I mean, we, there are other symbols, of course, within Christianity which do, but a, a single comprehensive uh, symbol like the Shiva symbol we do not have, and it's very unfortunate. In this whole business of the, 
of the organized um, manipulation of um, symbols is i mean the, the the human mind is a a symbolic instrument i mean it exists to manufacture symbols to turn immediate experience into symbols for the purpose of managing it with a, in a fairly convenient way uh, the question is uh, can, can we get on with uh, fairly scientific symbols realistic symbols and then uh, concentrate on the immediate experience i don't know i mean i, I simply don't know whether th this is a possible as a sort of general uh, attitude towards the world i think it's certainly possible in the in, in isolated individuals but uh, whether in fact it will ever turn out to, to be something which appeals to great numbers of people i have no idea but surely by its very nature mysticism hinges upon superstition can one have the flowering of mysticism without the dung of superstition. I don't know whether you can. Uh, there's a very interesting chapter in uh, Konzi's book on Buddhism, saying that it, as a matter of historical fact, these extremely elevated uh, mystical and philosophical doctrines of the Mahayana have always been associated with uh, grossest forms of superstition. Can it be avoided? I don't know. I mean, he, he is inclined to think that you don't get the one except growing out of the other. I, I hope it's possible to have a, an aseptic mysticism, but I don't know that it is. I, I think certain people can have it, but whether it, there can be a sort of general atmosphere on the basis of a, of a non-superstitious, non-dogmatic set of beliefs, I, I've no idea. I, I profoundly hope so, but... Uh, at certain times, I rather doubt it. The whole problem of dealing with the irrational is surely to to find out uh, means by which uh, these irrational drives can be given their satisfaction without harming the person who has the drives and without harming his neighbors. This is not past the wit of man to devise these methods. I mean, this was something which... William James, years ago, discussed in his essay The Moral Equivalence of War. This is a, a, an inadequate essay, but it, it uh, touches on an aspect, one aspect of an extraordinarily important uh, um, way of dealing with, with human beings. In fact, it is the only way of dealing satisfactorily with the irrational side of man. It requires satisfaction. The final highest and most difficult problem of reason is how can we allow the irrational its proper scope within a general framework of rationality and benevolence. Uh, I mean, the, empirically, all cultures have worked out uh, various methods. I mean, the whole Greek uh, method of menadism and bacchigorges and so on were well, all methods for getting rid of uh, these intolerable tensions in socially harm, harmless and even beneficent ways. The carnival, the Saturnalia, all these things are, are empirical devices uh, for, for doing precisely this. And I think one of our troubles is that we haven't got enough of these, um, these devices now. I mean, the Christianity became so wildly respectable that it gave up dancing, which was a grave mistake. It's very significant that the uh, this is an extremely, quote, spiritual sect of the Quakers, quaked. I mean, here there was this violent, involuntary quaking movement of the muscles, which was a, an immense release uh, and, a, so to say, an opening up of the organism to the free flow of the life force. And this was a, an empirical invention of great value. Uh, similarly, that the sort of deliberate dancing processes of the of Menadism and uh, Bacchantism and the Dionysiac orgies were also methods for involving the uh, the muscles in this general process of of release, of getting rid of of these pent up uh, irrational drives in harmless ways. And it seems to me that any civilization which um, seriously takes account of 
of man's nature is to invent these things. They've been invented again and again by primitive people and even quite advanced people. And we've made the awful mistake of dropping a lot of them. I mean, the best we can do is rock and roll, which is something which the boys and girls have had to invent for themselves. But there's no sort of social or religious sanction for this, which is the gravest mistake. Whereas in the past there was. I mean, menadism was was built into the whole social and religious pattern, and so was the, the Bacchic um, orgy system. We don't have to say that when the Quakers quaked or the Shakers shook, that this was necessarily the operation of the Holy Ghost within them. I mean, after all, the Pentecost, when people behaved in a strange way, the, the, the onlooker said, these men have drunk new wine. I mean, they did behave like drunks, uh, but they were getting rid of tensions and permitting the life force to flow through them. I think we can talk about this in realistic terms now without necessarily invoking supernatural explanations, but at the same time, the sort of basic, what may be called the basic supernaturalism, that the, what you might call the life force, uh, can be, you can talk of this and say that these these methods, which we now know about, why they're they happen, uh, that um, they are of value in as much as they do permit uh, this basic uh, source of energy and enlightenment to flow freely through an organism which is constantly blocking itself up and obstructing itself by the operations of the conscious ego. These are ways of getting rid of the conscious ego, of getting out of our own light which is what everybody has been talking about from the beginning of time. But, and I think we are now in a position to be able to talk about it in more or less naturalistic terms and not necessarily in these supernaturalistic terms which uh, the early Quakers or the Shakers or the dervishes used. How do you approach uh, uh, general ideas? I mean, is the best way of expounding general ideas, to expound them in abstract terms, which is, of course, the philosophical method, or should one try to write one's philosophy through the medium of individual case histories? This is what I have more and more tried to do. I mean, for example, in the few historical, three historical pieces I've ever written, uh, these were essentially attempts to uh, express general, in the widest sense, philosophical ideas in terms of particular case histories. I mean, there's this book I wrote about Father Joseph, the Grey Eminence, the book I wrote about the Devils of Loudun, and then the, this long essay I wrote on Maine de Biron. And I would like very much to find a, another good sort of biographical or historical episode that turned up, I mean, very years and years ago, I read the account in Michelet's book La Sorciere of the Loudin case and was interested and incidentally found when I came to look into the documents that it was extremely inaccurate. I mean, this, this great historian was very slapdash about the way he handled the, uh, his account of the case. Well, then I thought no more about it for many years and then quite by chance... Uh, picked up in a second-hand bookshop the 19th century reprint in a limited edition of the autobiography of the Prioress and uh, one of Surin's autobiographical things and uh, the late 17th century book by Aubin on the, which is an account of the whole episode. And reading those, I was so fascinated. I mean, there was such extraordinary material there that I began collecting it and found that, in fact, I don't think any historical episode has ever had so much documentation. There are autobiographical statements by the Prioress, by Father Surin, great many letters, all the exorcisms were taken down in shorthand, great many of them are printed, and of course a vast number still remain unprinted, but they're probably... I never read any of the unprinted material because I just can't manage those things. But I don't think they would have contributed anything because they, most of the exorcisms were very like one another, so that a reasonable cross-section of them probably represented the whole fairly clearly. Then there were a great many 
accounts by outsiders who come to look at the possessions. It became one of the sort of popular tourist resorts in 17th century Europe, and people went from all over the continent to see these nuns rolling about on the floor and screaming obscenities. It was obviously the greatest fun. These nuns, of course, were, were their own lunatic asylum, and the, the, whole, the whole convent was a lunatic asylum. This screaming and and with these exorcists deliberately keeping the thing up. I mean, the behavior of the exorcists is a degree of revoltingness and bad faith, which is absolutely appalling. After um, Grandier had been burned, they sent for the Jesuits to go across the, the nuns that remained just as much possessed and hysterical as ever. And as the uh, Capuchins had failed completely in their efforts at exorcism, they called for the Jesuits, and among whom was this remarkable, very, very able man, but very unstable, uh, uh, psychologically unstable man, Surin, who came from Bordeaux. And he undertook not merely to dispossess the priories, but also to raise her to the highest pitch of mystical perfection. And in the process, himself became psychologically infected and fell into a state of complete insanity in which he remained for 20 years, finally emerging and in the last seven or eight years of his life, becoming one of the major figures in the uh, French 17th century mysticism. And even while he was insane, when he couldn't, I mean, he was so sort of hopelessly down that he couldn't read or write or he could hardly even move. Uh, he was able to dictate a, a work of, on the spiritual life, which I've read. It's in three duodecimo volumes of about 1,200 pages, admirably well organized, with the copious quotations from the Gospels and from the Fathers. This man who couldn't read or write, I mean, showing that the whole of his intellectual faculties were completely intact while his emotional and physiological condition was absolutely disastrous. I mean, this man was uh, completely incapable of doing anything at all and was, in fact, a raving lunatic, which is, of course, one of the strangest facts about mental illness, that you, you can have these cases. I mean, I've seen them in contemporary life of, of uh, people whose intellectual faculties are perfectly sound, and yet whose emotional life is so disturbed that they have to remain locked up in institutions for years at a stretch. It's one of the oddest paradoxes, I find. The whole business of the, of the legal and psychological aspects of witchcraft at the, in the 17th century, very, very interesting. I read a lot about it at the time. It's very interesting to see how if you don't have a theory of the unconscious, you're virtually forced into the idea of possession. I mean, no, I think all the, the all the exorcists were convinced that this was a genuine diabolic possession. And of course they were being paid by the government. They were getting salaries. When the publicity wore off and people got bored with it, the whole possession disappeared. I mean, the nuns were under pressure from the exorcists to go on performing. And uh, when the, the money ran out, because they were being paid a subsidy by Richelieu, and they cut, a, cut the subsidy off after a time, and the public opinion got bored, and they all got well. Uh, and then the extraordinary thing, the Paris then made this tour of, of France exactly like a movie star, because she fabricated... Uh, false stigmata on her hand, which she showed. She used to sit in a window with her hand hanging out, and thousands of people would come and examine these letters which were written on the hand, supposedly by supernatural means. And she went to visit the king and queen and had this wonderful time. And then again, that was all over. I mean, it was like a sort of Marilyn Monroe procession through the country. And then, very pathetically, I mean, uh, she became convinced that she was a sort of second St. Teresa and was going to be a great mystical saint. But of course, in fact, she wasn't. 
who was sort of acting the part of a great mystical saint. And, but in the end, she developed cancer, and uh, a lay woman came to live in the monastery, who was a genuinely spiritual person. And it's very touching. I mean, she ended up as quite a humble, genuinely Christian figure in the end. I mean, it's very, she made a good ending in the language of the, of the church. I mean, she, she really understood her own defects and, uh, and this endless play acting which she'd been doing all her life. But the, of course, the, the really strange thing about this whole story is that the whole Loudin affair is interesting only if you take the two sides together. If you take the case of Grandier and then the case of Surin, between them, the, uh, the two episodes describe the religious life on every level, the most horrible to the most sublime. I mean, the whole gamut of religious life is set forth in a kind of parabolic form in these two episodes. Now, the really extraordinary thing is that, as far as I know, I was the first person to bring these two episodes together in a single volume. Plenty of French people have written about Grandier, and in recent times, plenty of people have written about Surin. But nobody has thought fit to put the two cases together in a single volume and illustrate this, uh, this uh, fantastic uh, spectrum of the religious life, from the most revolting to the, through the most equivocal to the most sublime. I mean, this is the the whole sort of, of message of this extraordinary episode, that religion is infinitely ambivalent. I mean, that it, it has these wonderful sides to it and these appalling sides to it. And the interesting thing to do in discussing it, of course, is to bring out both aspects. And here is a story which is strictly historical, and I really never departed from the historical documents, which is at the same time a parable. And the, this is what I'm looking for, is a historical or biographical medium in terms of which uh, I can think about uh, all sorts of general subjects and philosophical subjects, because I, I do strongly feel that philosophical and religious ideas are much better expressed, not in abstract terms, but in terms of concrete case histories biographical or historical, and if you can find the, the right kind of case histories, you can uh, find means of writing what may be called philosophy. I mean, this perhaps is, a, is too presumptuous a term for what I've written, but I mean, it does permit the, the expression of general ideas in a much more powerful and penetrating way than would be possible if you were just writing about the same things in abstract terms. Why did you come to settle down in California? I went to California not intending to stay indefinitely. I went, to, first of all, to stay with Frida Lawrence in her ranch in New Mexico, and then went on to California to see some friends there. And I had this idea of going on to India after that, that sort of vague invitation to lecture there. But then I found uh, someone who could help me with my vision, which was rapidly going downhill at the time. And um, I took these, this sort of course in visual re-education, which helped me a great deal. And then the war broke out. And then my first wife was still alive uh, and showed signs of TB, and we had to go and live in a, in a very dry climate in the desert. And then... Sort of, uh, then I found the climate suited me very well, and the general inertia kept me there. And I, I, I get it, it, I find it very satisfactory. I, I see better in a bright climate than in a dark one, and I feel better in a warm climate than in a cold one. How often have you taken mescaline yourself? I've taken mescaline twice and lysergic acid about five times, I suppose. I would like to take it about once a year, I think. But one uh, doesn't, most people I, that I know who've taken it have no desire to sort of fool with it and take it constantly. I mean, the thing, you take it too seriously to, to behave in this way towards it. You want to wallow in it. I mean, you need a good deal of time to digest this, I think. I mean, I don't know, most people I know feel it don't 
have any special desire to go on taking it. I mean, that they would like to take it every six months or every year or something of that kind. But uh, I still have to meet one who wants to take it constantly. But isn't it a condition one would want to be in all the time? You couldn't be in it all the time because it's, um, it is, so to say, beyond the the level of um, biological efficiency. The world becomes so extraordinary and so absorbing that you couldn't cross the street without considerable risk of being run over. And you wouldn't want to do anything else because just experiencing this thing is so extraordinary. Is the effect the same on everyone? Statistically, about 70% of 75% probably <clears throat> get a good and positive, happy result from it. A certain percentage get no results, and a certain percentage get very unpleasant and hell-like results out of it, get very frightened. Mine were always positive. Uh, I didn't have what some people have, which is a great elaborate visions with the eyes closed. Some people have the most elaborate and uh, circumstantial visionary experiences. I'm With the eyes closed, I merely see sort of living geometries, but uh, never any of these great landscapes and figures and architectures which some people see. Do you sit or do you move about? Spend a lot of time sitting quietly, looking at things and uh, getting these sort of strange metaphysical insights into, into, the, into the world. Is it a habit-forming drug? In most cases, it has no more hangover than two cocktails, and some people feel actually much better the next day. It's being used to some extent in, in therapy. There's a man here called Sanderson who uses it a lot. There are several people in America who... In, in Canada, there are several groups who have had very, very good results with alcoholism using LSD. And there's a new drug now, the psilocybin, which is um, derived from the Mexican mushroom, which is the same effect but doesn't last quite so long. And that is being used in France uh, therapeutically with some success. Can you take a, a capsule of um, 400 milligrams and the Lysergic acid, you take this incredibly small dose of 100 gamma, which is 100 millionths of a gram, a ten thousandth of a gram, tenth of a milligram, which is a homeopathic dose. It's a perfect, extraordinary that it should have an effect. And in fact, it has an effect uh, long after all traces of it have gone out of the body. It has an effect by triggering some, nobody knows exactly what, it probably inhibits one of the 27 enzymes which control the functioning of the brain either inhibits one or stimulates one, and I don't think anybody quite knows what it does. But the intensity of the experience is entirely unlike uh, any ordinary experience. But on the other hand, it's, uh, it quite obviously resembles spontaneous experiences <laughs> which certain artists and religious people have unquestionably had. It's an immense intensification of the world, the uh, transfiguration of the external world into incredible beauty and uh, significance. And it's also beyond this kind of aesthetic experience. There may be other experiences, a sense of um, solidarity with the universe, solidarity with other people. So, understanding of such phrases as you get in the book of Job, yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. It becomes quite comprehensible. This thing opens the door to these, uh, these experiences, which can be of immense value to people if they choose to make use of them, if they don't choose to. I mean, this is what the Catholics call a gratuitous grace. It doesn't guarantee salvation or... And it's not sufficient and it's not necessary salvation, but if it can be collaborated with and used in a, an intelligent way, it can be of immense help to people. The sense that in spite of everything, which of course is the ultimate, uh, I suppose, the ultimate mystical conviction, in spite of pain, in spite of death, in spite of horror, the, 
the universe is in some mysterious sense all right, capital A, capital R. Mm. 